All right. Hello, everyone. Identifying patterns of harmful people, the invisible thread revealing connections between domestic abusers and cult leaders. So just consider for a moment what this invisible thread might be. It's a pleasure for me to speak with you all today about coercive control. It's a personal area of passion of mine to help educate the public about coercive control and the various environments in which it takes place. So you have an idea of who I am. I have a master's in the psychology, psychology of coercive control. I'm part of what we're calling the Coercion Coalition, a group looking to engage in different types of law reform around coercive control here in the US and learning from those in other countries who have been integral in coercive control legislation establishment. I've also recently been trained in expert witness work to serve on cases involving coercive control, mostly domestic cases. And I've completed accredited training with Laura Richards, who some of you may be familiar with, on the domestic abuse, stalking, and honor-based violence, risk identification, assessment, and management model, which was first implemented across all police services in the UK from March 2009. That's accredited by the National Police Chief Council. And I'm a research associate at Salford University, and I do work with survivors one-to-one -one and also uh, run group programs. So today we'll be looking at two of the environments in which coercive control takes place. Through the lens of coercive controllers in one-to-one -one relationships, as well as group environments with coercively controlling leadership. Many of you may be familiar with the concept of one-to-one -one cults typically referred to as domestic abuse cases. And this is because we find coercive controllers at the heart of both situations. First, let's learn a little about coercive control and why we sometimes hear it referred to as the invisible web of abuse. Coercive control is an unseen pattern of harm. It's the part of domestic violence that's not the bruise or scars. Did you know that many survivors of domestic violence who have experienced coercive control will tell you that it's the psychological denigration and emotional turmoil that's the most impactful with long lasting repercussions. Similarly, in research I conducted regarding the impact on individuals who have received internal family systems therapy in response to having experienced coercive control, I discovered a theme that arose in almost all accounts was a description of participants' inner experience as having left them feeling confused and tangled. I noticed the use of this description of needing to untangle the experience as very common for both domestic violence survivors as well as cult survivors. We know that 51% of domestic violence survivors report not having realized they've been abused, manipulated, or controlled. So I'm going to just ground us into a legal definition that was established in 2015 as part of the Serious Crimes Act. This is Section 76 was added under the offense of controlling and coercive behavior. So controlling or coercive behavior does not relate to a single incident, but rather it is a purposeful pattern of behavior, which takes place over time in order for one individual to exert power, control, or coercion over another. The Serious Crimes Act focuses responsibility and accountability on the perpetrator who is chosen to carry out these behaviors. It identifies a range of acts designed to make a person subordinate and or dependent by isolating them from sources of support, exploiting their resources and capacities for personal gain, depriving them of means needed for independence, resistance, escape, and regulating their everyday behavior. It acknowledges that a continuing act or pattern of acts of assaults, threats, humiliation, and intimidation, or other abuse that is used to harm, punish, or frighten their victim. It recognizes the harm caused by coercion or control and the cumulative impact on the victim. It also can result 
in CPTSD, so post-traumatic stress disorder, which does include anxiety, depression, dissociation, Okay, so this is a list that you guys can just scan as I'm speaking. It's not intended to be an exhaustive list. So please know that the impact of any one of the items on the list can be devastating and long lasting. Please be aware that coercive control can lead again to a host of psychological problems related to an assault on one's sense of self. In general, coercive control is not something that's being addressed in the US. It's not reflected in the laws. And if it is, it's within the family court systems and only in a few states within the US. We see with the Serious Crimes Act of 2015, the UK is years ahead of us. At the moment, coercive control is not well understood and goes unacknowledged in cults, gangs, sex trafficking, and even domestic situations. So I'm now going to try to address some of the connections between domestic abusers and cult leaders through this lens of coercive control. It's likely that many of you are familiar with domestic abuser profiles, most of whom are, or, yeah, most of whom are using the intimidation and fear tactics of coercive control. But I continue to consider cult leaders who are coerc coercive controllers when I see these profiles and thought it could be helpful to draw some parallels as it may actually open us to consider the seriousness of the situation. We have excellent statistics and studies on domestic abuse cases, but we continue to be stumped it seems on holding cult leaders accountable unless they do something blatantly illegal. I've used Lundy Bancroft's 10 profiles of abusive men to prompt some of these parallels with cult leaders. So I'm not necessarily saying that the profiles correlate perfectly, but rather I'm wanting to identify these traits and scenarios that are used by abusive humans to control, manipulate, gain power and dominance. My hope is that this lecture provides you with connections that might be turned into a gauge to help you identify, detect, and trust your gut when you encounter a coercive controller. I'd also quickly want to acknowledge here that for the sake of ease and to honor also the inherent power differential between men and women, I'll refer to the perpetrators as men, but of course, cult leaders can be women and women can be abusive toward men. Also, we know through research and studies that there are elements to a group environment they can have a powerful influence, especially when dynamics of persuasion or authority are at play alongside group think and the principles of, um, oh, and conformity. So I won't be addressing those directly, but I wanna just acknowledge that. I'm gonna run through the abuse profiles fairly quickly. So especially if you yourself have been under the influence of a cult leader, I'm sure you'll make some interesting connections yourself as we fly through the slides. All right. Demand man. <clears throat> so the primary features are entitlement and selfishness, also criticizes frequently. He takes versus giving back and feels that his partner owes him. His good deeds are highly valued, like cleaning a dish. He will punish. And when he's nice, he wants something from his partner. If his needs are in contradiction, she will be, she will need to be self-sacrificial. -sacrific will he show love? Yes, but when it benefits him. Partners of the demand man never feel like anything they do is good enough. The cult leader gets away with entitlement and selfishness, which often goes unrecognized by members because the leader is revered by the group. The cult leader talks a humble, humble talk, but in a cult, the agenda is always in service to the cult leader and not what's deceptively promised to members. Many cult leaders are high demand. I think about Yogi Bhajan with his secretariat women who were at his beck and call for massages and more. Selfishness and taking were definitely at play here. Most cult leaders keep everyone feeling not quite good enough 
which keeps them in a position of authority, providing the answers for the imperfect ones while creating dependency, which entraps. Cult leaders are able to commit horrific acts because for them, the end goal justifies the means. Mr. Wright is defined by superiority and omniscience. Mr. Wright bulldozes his partner's opinions, desires, thoughts, and actions to establish his own as the only right answer. He's right about everything, not just areas he's educated in, and he's especially right when it comes to errors of his partner. Mr. Wright will twist the words of his partner to make them sound more absurd, thereby misrepresenting the partner. Partners of Mr. Wright learn to not trust their own opinion and knowledge, thereby outsourcing their thinking to Mr. Wright. The cult leader is defined by superiority and omniscience, right about everything. I remember having an aha moment a number of years ago when I was watching a 15 minute documentary on Andrew Cohen, who ran the group Enlighten Next. In this documentary released by The Atlantic, Sam Rosen, one of his followers, stated this realization he had afterward when he shared something to the effect that, I get that I relied on him for the spiritual, these new enlightened spiritual ideas, but why on earth would I submit all aspects of my life to someone who claims to be a spiritual teacher? When we're thinking critically, this seems obvious. We go, per we, we go to particular people to ask business advice, how to run a business, health, health issues, how to parent. But cult leaders claim to know it all and therefore don't stay in their lane, so to speak. It's a powerful dynamic in cults whereby the cult leader begins to hold the power to comment on everything and anything in a follower's life. When this happens, the leader is able to misrepresent followers to both themselves and the group using a thread of truth. Often this thread of truth begins with a follower feeling seen, but gradually they are trapped and held down by whatever weakness or issue the leader fixates on. Often what I see with first generation survivors when they leave a self-improvement cult is that despite being a group that's supposed to be transformative, they leave with the same issue they initially were labeled with, as the clouds part, the survivor is shocked to realize that the issue they were pathologized with within the group is something that the cult leader purposefully embellished their identification with. Or sometimes the leader has even made up memories for the victim designed to further isolate the member from family and the outside world while creating further dependency on the leader, the doctrine or tools. The water torturer. So water torture is a method used in interrogation when one drips cold water onto the face or scalp of another in order to get them to expose their secrets. In looking at the faces of abuse, the water torturer uses their quiet derision against their partner to abuse them. He's an expert at maintaining his cool. He knows how to push his partner's buttons until they explode. Then he calmly informs her that she is abusive because she raised her voice. He gets great pleasure out of convincing everyone around him, including his partner, that she is the one who is crazy and abusive. The water torturer's subtle cruelty is relentless. His mastery of calmness allows him to escape the label of abuser in his own mind. Because he is an expert at the presentation of a calm exterior, he is able to convince others that his partner is the problem. He often uses a silent treatment or ignores his partner to cause her to explode. They do not raise their voice, they do not express anger, but they do speak about their partner in mean-spirited ways with sarcasm, mimicry, slight physical acts such as pushing or even laughter. The water torturer dissolves the dignity of their partner and is often successful because their partner cannot report or confront abuse when it doesn't look like how we typically think of as abuse. This reiterates the importance of Bancroft's work as he encourages us to consider the different faces of the abuser, 
like the facets of a diamond. Multiple faces will be adopted by one individual. Abusers are multidimensional and adaptable. They will use what's convenient and personal to harm. The cult leader. The cult leader is the puppet master who calmly sits, elevated, with disciples at his feet, while day after day he subtly dissolves the dignity or sense of self in his followers, all under the guise of helping them. Here I present the case of my dear friend and colleague, colleague Callie Sorensen, who was part of Bentinho Massaro's inner circle. She describes his cool, calm demeanor and how he would take pleasure in convincing others they weren't as clear or enlightened as he was. The message he drilled into Callie involved evil entities attacking her. When she expressed suicidality to an inner circle member, she was told the evil entities were now implanted in her brain and the whole mission could be jeopardized. Bentinho expressed in a group thread that she was the weakest link on the team. Take a minute to really consider this. How terrifying to believe this, especially when you're suicidal. How this erodes self-trust and even the sanctity of your body and mind. From the outside, we now look at this and can recognize that Bentinho created this extreme state of suicidality within her. But within that context, no one would recognize what was actually happening. I think of Callie and others as the canaries in the coal mine and now hopefully free to use their voices in whatever ways they are so moved. The drill sergeant, Control and isolation are the hallmarks of the drill sergeant, largely due to strong feelings of jealousy and a lack of trust. Bancroft likens this relationship to an eight-year-old having a tyrannical father who controls every aspect of her life, from her work to friends. Behind his hateful rhetoric of women is a man who does not practice what he preaches. If he accuses his spouse of cheating, it may be that he is the one doing the cheating because it isn't fidelity he cares about, it's possession. Bancroft's quote, <clears throat> when threats don't seem to get the job done, the drill sergeant is likely to employ acts of physical violence to control their partner. Let's remember that although the drill sergeant is perhaps the stereotype of what one considers to be an abusive person, this is still just one face of the abuser. Possession for a cult leader might look like his ability to have sex, sorry, I should have done a trigger warning at the beginning. <laughs> um, possession for a cult leader might look like his ability to have sex with other men's wives, while the married couple are told to be celibate. David Koresh had this set up. This enables the cult leader to possess the woman, have vicarious control over the husbands, while severing the intimacy and bond between wife and husband. Cult leaders will often control intimate relationships. They will ex this will extend not just between couples, but the family unit within the cult, severing bonds between parents and children by farming out kids to other families or having the children care for by someone chosen for this role. Any alliances with others outside the group, including of course, family members is also cut off. The drill sergeant also reminds me of cult leaders placing such high demands on followers such that tremendous amounts of time are devoted to the group and its mission and exercises that indoctrinate or numb community members and put, and, and so sometimes this um, looks like meditation, chanting for Koresh, it would be biblical based lectures and prayer. And in a quote from an article about the Branch Davidians, which is David Koresh's group in Waco, Texas, former followers said discipline was constantly administered. Joanne Vega, who was six years old when she left the compound, said she remembers being hit regularly. And quote, as a kid, being disciplined was like a 24-7 thing. There's nothing that you could not, that you could do right, is how I felt as a kid. That fear that nothing you can do is going to be good enough, she said. 
You're raised with just fear. Fear is everywhere. Vega said Koresh constantly told them the end of the world was coming. They were, quote, the chosen people to survive because David was the son of God. She said they were taught to prepare for war. And that the end times, as predicted in the book of Revelation, were near. This is why the community had stockpiled weapons when the Waco incident went down. In the example of David Koresh, the abuser might be the drill sergeant, Mr. Wright, the water torturer, and any of the other remaining facets. Another insidious face of abuse is Mr. Sensitive. This one appears to be a special man in touch with his feelings, his commitment to self-improvement and making the world a better place, but his sensitivity is not without its abusive side. Mr. Sensitive has zero tolerance for being hurt. Even when his partner apologizes profusely, it will never be enough and it will be used against her later. But when he hurts her, he minimizes it and tells her to move on. Eventually, the sensitivity gives way to intimidation and threats due to his inability to forgive her for things she's already apologized for. He may even become physically violent, but instead of taking accountability, he will instead blame her for his abusive actions. This technique is referred to in the domestic violence world as DARVO. This is an acronym for Defend, Attack, Reverse Victim Offender. When a, so when an abuser is typically caught, he will defend himself, that's the D. He'll attack the actual victim, and then he manipulates to reverse the victim and offender role. So he is seen as the victim. Similarly, cult leaders do not claim accountability when confronted. There may be a spiritual reason provided, but the cult leader will not be held to account. An interesting parallel to consider here is that a Mr. Sensitive could also show up in spiritual settings and be somewhat protected by spiritual teachings. Cult leaders will twist the spiritual to serve whatever message they want. This is typically easy to do when we're dealing with the unprovable. So I thought it might be helpful here to say a little about this process of cult indoctrination as shared by Michael Langone and his three Ds. So some of you may be familiar with us, deception, dependence, and dread. My hope is that this sheds some light on the indoctrination process that happens psychologically, internally within an individual in a cult environment. So we're addressing a state here where one is now considered a convert. So the convert's self-alienation will tend to demand further psychological, if not physical, alienation from the non-group world especially family, but also alienation from information, as this threatens to upset whatever dissociative equilibrium the convert has established inside of themselves in an attempt to adjust to the consuming and conflicting demands of the group. This alienation accentuates the convert's dependency on the group. The group supports the convert's dissociative equilibrium by actively encouraging escalating dependency. So by exaggerating the convert's past sins and conflicts with family, by denigrating outsiders, by positively reinforcing the chanting, meditation, or other thought-stopping or numbing activities, and by providing the positively reinforcing ways in which the convert can find a valued role within the group. The group strengthens the convert's growing dependency by threatening or inflicting punishment whenever the convert or an outside force, so like a visit from a family member, disturbs the dissociative equilibrium that enables him or her to function in a closed, non-falsifiable system. This is the dread part of the Ds. Punishment may sometimes be physical. Usually, however, the punishment's psychological, sometimes even metaphysical, 
certainly fringe Christian groups, for example, can at the command of leadership immediately begin shunning someone singled out as being negative or possessed of a rebellious spirit. I'm on point. <laughs> Langone reminds us that it should be remembered that these threats and punishments occur within the context of induced dependency and psychological alienation from a person's former support network. Okay, so this is the, the, the part of that power of this all-consuming kind of cultic group dynamic that I was referring to that I'm not going to take a deep dive into. But this is different, right? This is a process that's different than going to a church once a week with a message from the pulpit regarding sin or hell. Right? This is a repeated pattern that causes fear and terror. The playa. So the player is someone who is incapable of taking women seriously as human beings, but rather regard them as playthings. To the player, a woman is just a person with whom one has sex with. Cheating is a common factor. The player tends to have his collection of women who he pits against one another as they compete for the grand prize, him. He lacks integrity in that he may treat a woman like they're the only one in the world, but then won't commit. This is the cult leader who creates an environment where women surround him to serve him. He's likely having sex with them and of course, turning them on one another. There's likely a high amount of secrecy so the women don't compare notes and realize that they are not the only one being told they're special. This can be seen in the reckoning around hashtag yoga too. So you may get the parallel there with the me too. Actually gonna jump ahead a bit with my timing. Rambo. Rambo is the kind of abuser that most people recognize. He's aggressive with everyone, not just his partner. He yells at the ref during the sports games, gets road rage, and won't hesitate to punch another guy in the face if he's offended. Rambo believes that his worth lies in his physical strength. Anything considered weak or feminine is inferior. Women are on earth to serve men. Rambo sees his partner as his personal property. His partner is impressed at first that he defends her honor, but is in for a shock when the aggressive attitude targets her. The cult leader might be viewed through a more patriarchal and misogynistic lens in this case, if looking especially at a spiritual or religious cult leader. So we see this in some of the recent documentaries in Shiny Happy People about the Gothard teachings and the Duggar family story. But Andrew Tate, of course, is one of the best examples of this type of exploitation by making an internet business off of his teachings that exploit women. The victim is an expert at feeling sorry for himself. Everyone is out to get him or has done him wrong. His failed relationships are all her fault. He spends a lot of time badmouthing his former partners, his mom, his teachers, and anyone else he can blame for his failures. This could be the cult leader with the history of abuse that they almost wear as a badge of honor. When I look at Teal Swan, this rings familiar in her story of being exposed to satanic rituals and also her status of having been suicidal. She now targets and attracts millennials who are suicidal, and in my opinion, uses psychological techniques that are very unhealthy and detrimental to her followers. Kind of a different way to look at the whatever you do to me, I'm going to do to you idea. I'd suspect that part of Teal's justification for extreme healing practices, where she's likely harming people, is rooted more in believing that she knows how to heal what she went through. So she feels justified in whatever techniques because she thinks she knows better. Well, I apologize, my time is up. I will end here.